Good morning. Great to see you all here. I am Pastor Linda, and I'm so happy to bring the word this morning. I have a little uh, prop this morning, and we're going to do a little school show and tell. Can everybody see this? I'm going to try not to drop it. All right. Can everybody see this? Okay. You've got your screens, right? There we are. Oh, boy. Don't look at myself up there. Okay. <laughs> this is a clay pot. We're going to call it a pot today. That was made circa 1984 by my husband, Tim. Where's Tim? Can you wave, my dear? I know. He's agreed to let me kind of uh, call him out today. He made this in grade 10. So that was, here we go, 39 years ago. And this, this pot, he, he loves this pot. And we like to say that this pot is actually very resilient because it has survived many decluttering campaigns in our house. It has survived what I think is it's a little harsh, but he calls it an assassination attempt on my part when we were newly married, and I, I didn't know the rules, you know, and uh, about this pot, and I threw it in the garbage thinking, oh, it's just an old, <laughs> an old, uh, you know, school project, and he retrieved it out of the garbage, you know, and was very happy that it didn't get ruined. It survived a garage sale that I sort of slipped onto the table to see how much it would go for. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so here it is. And it has survived all of this time. And this pot is a product of a transformation. Because at one time, this pot was a big old mound of clay. And as I thought about this pot, I said, my goodness, and we're approaching New Life Sunday. And we just heard that it is coming next week. And we celebrate, it is a time that we celebrate transformation. It is a time that we celebrate something that was old transformed into something new. And when we think about the word transformation, it says to make a thorough and dramatic change in the form, appearance, and character of something. And that is what happens. The for, something before becomes after. Something before Christ, after death the way it was to the way it is now. And so we're going to go to the beginning here in of all of us. Psalm 51.5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Well, that's bad news, isn't it? That we kind of had no choice in the matter. That right at that moment of birth, and by the way, this can be good news because at the moment of our birth, before we ever had a chance to mess up on a huge level, or maybe as we call it, maybe on the small sins that really all sin is the same. But the, the playing field was totally even at the point of our birth. We were all the old man. We were all in need of saving. We were all born into sin. And so if you feel you, could, you walk in condemnation today, just know, hey, we were all the same. Our plight is the same. Born into sin. There's an old you and a new you. And when Jesus entered the picture, oh, this love-filled decision that Jesus made to come and walk this earth, to come to allow himself to be crucified, to allow himself to be buried, and again to resurrect, we can identify with this work of Christ that this old, this old person that we are, as we, and we're going to be doing this in the waters of baptism as we identify with the burial of Christ, the old man dies. And the Christ-filled you comes alive. Thank God. Thank God. Absolutely. And so in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, the new, behold, the new has come. This verse does not exist without the words in Christ. Does not exist. All of it is nullified and void without the in Christ. And so, as we say, God, thank you for this transformation. What happens when I accept Christ and I say yes to Jesus? There is this old man that passes away, 
and behold, you can see it, Jesus is saying. When you behold something, you can see it. The new has come. And so we are transformed. What, what did God have in mind? Because from that's the beginning, by the way. That is, that is just the beginning. And what did God have in mind for us as we embark and live this transformed life? And I want to talk to you about a few of these things today. And the first one, and I think the most important, you were transformed into relationship with God and transformed for relationship with God. You see, mankind, all of us, whether we want to, we like to talk about it or not, we have been on a rebellious streak right from the very beginning of time. I want it my way. I want to do things my, you know, according to my will. How did that work for us? Not very good. All right, so we had this rebellious streak, and then God gave a way of making sacrifices that we could, in the Old Testament, that they could, you know, kill the lamb and do all the things that were outlined. And okay, we did it. It was, it was within our grasp something to help change this dire situation and help to reverse this rebellious streak. And so we say, what does, how does God see us now? Well, he says, after Jesus, in Ephesians 2.12, remember that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's about the worst state of affairs I can think of. Let's list them. Separated from Christ, alienated, strangers, no hope, and without God. No relationship. Lost. Isolation estrangement. If anybody's ever gone through estrangement with anyone in your life, you know that, how that feels, how terrible that is. Strangers to the covenant, alienated. Maybe if you've left your home country and come to a new one and you know that feeling of being so separate and how devastating that can feel. But there's a part two to this verse. Well, it's verse 13. But now, I love the but nows in the Bible. There's a few of them. I was going to say, I love the, I won't say it. Okay. All right. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, excuse me, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let me read it again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay. So this is a proximity issue. This is, you were once far away and now you're brought close. That's the first miracle right there. We were separate and now we're close. But God didn't stop there. Because how many know that you can be standing beside someone and not really know them and not really be close to them, right? This is more than God accepting you into his friend group. He's, uh, you know, liking you on Facebook. This is more than you being part of his Snapchat group chat help somebody. Is that, my daughter's embarrassed. Yes, right? So it's far more than that. It's a status change. It's, it's the, the very nature of our relationship with God now changes. Thank you, God. Romans 8, 16, 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. (laughs) You can't read that and not be happy about this. That's amazing. The spirit himself bears witness. What does that mean? Well, it means that you know now. You feel it. You know it. The Holy Spirit is telling you that, that you belong now. And our spirits are connected, and that we're children, connected now into the family of God. Not just proximity, but close and intimate. And of course, we know that when we are family, we are called the sons and daughters of God. We are, we are co-heirs with Christ. 
Jesus, our elder brother. That means everything that God has as an inheritance for Christ. We now get to take part in it. We get to have it too. <laughs> that's a relation. Yeah, that's good. You can clap about that. Amen. We are valued in the same way God the Father values the Son. He softened our hearts. He put in us from creation before the fall. That our, in our very DNA, the desire for relationship with God. You know, uh, my mom used to say, she used to tell me, they got, my parents got saved as adults. They were later in life. Right, Dad? Yes. He's not nodding, but anyhow. Uh, <laughs> it's true. We were little when my parents got saved. And I remember my mom saying, Linda, when you, when you first get saved, she said, you cry a lot. And she said, it's like everything that's old inside of you, it's like it comes out your eyes. <laughs> and she said, your heart is soft. You're all of a sudden, the world is brighter. Can anybody attest to that? <laughs> And she said it was like, it's just such an amazing thing. Why? Because you have entered into this love, love relationship that you've never known before. What a beautiful thing. And if you've, like me, little, come to know Christ, that as we, as we grow in our relationship throughout our lives with God, hopefully we get stronger and we grow closer to God. That's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. But we can't lose sight of what the transforming work of God really is. Mm. The sky is brighter when you know God. It's a relationship. John 15, 15, it says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Friends. I'm going to quote Gloria Gaither. Anybody like Gloria Gaither or Gaither music? She said, Jesus loves me. It's the first thing that I ever knew about Jesus, and it has gotten me through every bit of sorrow and every bit of joy. And that is so true. And when, when life comes at us, as it does, <laughs> and we can remember, what is it that I am transformed for? Jesus loves me, and I love him. And if I have that intact, I'm okay, and I'm going to be okay transformed for relationship. Okay, and when we are in relationship with God, we move from there into our purpose. We move there into what God is doing in us and through us, but it has to begin out of relationship, everybody, because if it doesn't, then we're hired hands, right? If we say, okay, I'm in, I'm in my purpose, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to do all the things, but if if there's no relationship with God, we're going to get into works. We're going to get into people pleasing. We're going to get into trying to find a way to uh, please God that's not rooted in love and relationship. So we got to be careful about that. And so I want to tell you a really quick story from the Bible uh, in the book of Philemon. I don't, I, some people say Philemon. I don't know. It doesn't roll off my mouth. Is that the wrong way to say it? Philem, Philemon. How about that? Is that fine? And Philemon is is uh, the recipient of the letter of Paul. Paul is in chains at this point, in jail, and he's writing to Philemon on behalf of somebody, the main part of this book, on, on a man, for a man named Onesimus, which might be another way of, I don't know if it's Onesimus or whatever, but I'm going to call him Onesimus today. <sighs> I don't know. And so Onesimus was a slave, a slave to Philemon. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, as the story goes, Onesimus stole something from Philemon and took off. And uh, as the story goes, he finds his way to Paul. Paul in jail. And somehow, they form a bond and a relationship with one another. And now, as one semester is in, coming to faith in Christ, wants to come back to Philemon. And so Paul sets himself up here in this letter as an advocate for one semester. And he says, 
in verse 10, there's only one chapter, so. <laughs> verse 10, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you. Hmm, we'll stop there. So the first thing I want to say, let's look at how he refers to him. He calls him a son. The very first thing that Paul is letting Philemon know is that the nature of his relationship with him is son. It is strong. That doesn't get any stronger, right? It's tight. They're tight. He's my son now, once a mess. And he's letting Philemon know this. So my son, while I was in chains, formerly he was useless to you. Now, I don't want to get into the whole cultural dynamic of slaves and not slaves, but I will say this. When you are any person is enslaved to anyone else, you are not living the life that God has for you. You cannot live your full life when you are enslaved. So I'm sure there were a lot of dynamics going on here, but regardless of them, Onesimus was in a state of useful, uselessness to Philemon at the time. And, and Paul is letting him know, I know that when he was with you, he was useless. So I'm going to excuse my back. How many of us have ever felt like there's a sign over our head? Can everybody see that? Useless. Can anybody identify with that? Why? What happened? It has happened to all of us. It has, there are moments in our life where either it's circumstances that have gone on, maybe some sort of trauma, some sort of phase of your life, maybe addiction takes hold of your life, maybe apathy to the things of God has rendered you useless. Maybe it's actually a lie that you're telling yourself. Maybe you're not. But actually, sometimes we can talk ourselves into saying, I'm no good. I'm useless. What am I really here for? I don't have a purpose in my life. We've forgotten the relationship that God has, has with us. And this is how we kind of walk around the world like this, like a cloud or a sign over our head. This can happen, and it can happen so easily. And this is what where Onesimus was in his life at one time. But 10b, here's another but. But now, Paul says, he has become useful both to you and to me, and I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. He loves him. There's, that's three times that he is referred in such a short passage of scripture to the relationship that he has with Onesimus. And Paul is seeing something here that, that maybe Philemon didn't see because Philemon is, maybe he's hurt over the, whatever he stole from him. He doesn't trust him. Who knows, okay? But you see, we can't be useful to anyone when we see ourselves as a slave. We can't be useful to the kingdom of God if you see yourself as just going through the motions, not loved, your, your sense of who you are is not in God, but it's in other things, and other things people have said over you, you will be useless. But see, God wants to change that. He wants for your sake to change that, because you are made for more. You are made for the full, the full complement of what God has for you. His arm is not short to anybody. And when I talk about coming into usefulness and purpose, I don't necessarily mean standing on this stage. This is one thing, but we're just people, right? You can be useful for the kingdom of God no matter where, what you're doing, no matter where you are. Maybe you're watching from home and you're a shut-in and you say, man, I wish I could be there. You are useful and we need you. The body of Christ, we need one another. We need it. We need your prayers we need, we need to show the love to each other. We are the family of God. What gets us through hard times in our lives? It's each other. And so when we say, okay, God, I might feel like I'm useless. Take me, show me my use." 
fullness. And that foundation is being loved by God. And so he says, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. Okay, a little bit more about this story. Paul keeps going. Perhaps, Paul starts to, you know, expound. I love it. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. The two things I want to call out first is man and brother. Paul is restoring identity and dignity back to onesomeness. Okay? And in this, by saying as a man, when you're a slave, you don't have an identity. Right? You don't, there's no sense of personhood. You belong to the person who owns you. And Paul is restoring that by this letter. As I'm, I'm, I'm sending him back to you transformed. I'm sending him back to you as a man and a brother. And that's a, that denotes relationship as well. And the next part, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. So Paul is actually laying his whole life and his reputation down on one semester. He must really trust him. He must really have an investment in him. And I want to say, Paul right here, this is a type of Christ. This is is what Jesus did for us as he went to the cross and he said everything that was done, all the sin from, I mean, from the very beginning to the very end, lay it on me, charge it to me. I will take it on. It is mine now. It is not yours to pay for anymore. I will be the payment. And that's what Paul is saying here. But in that place, he's standing in the place of Christ. And so today, whatever you have done, whatever's gone on in your life, we have a savior, an advocate who spread his arms out and said, I'll take it on. I will be that for you. And I'll stand in that place. That is our purpose as we go forward and the very foundation of our purpose. And so uh, one thing about the pot too, uh, I asked him what it's actually for. <laughs> I, said, it's a, I said, the hole's a little small. Is it an ashtray? You know, it was the 80s, so everybody smoked back then, right? So is it an ashtray? Was it a, and he, well, first he said, how dare you? <laughs> And then he said, he because we were, I was messaging him from the office, and then he said, it's for the authentic visual pleasure it brings to those who view it. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> it's so funny, it's so funny. But you know what? He just likes looking at the thing. <laughs> it sits on a shelf by his workbench. And you know what? You are for the authentic pleasure of your father. He loves you. uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes says, if you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion. For your passion will lead you right into your purpose. What's our passion? And and I, I meet with a lot of women who say, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know. And, and you know, when we start thinking about this, this is a, a really good verse. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's a recipe right there for understanding. Testing and approving is knowing, right? And understanding. God's will for our lives, well, we we say, well, what is it? Well, it's by being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means from purposelessness, from that lie that we tell ourselves, moving into purposefulness, God, show me who you've created me to be and renew my mind so that I see it and I know it, so I don't walk around limping, uh, you know, 
half, half at work for the kingdom of God and half brokenhearted, half, half despondent, half knocked out. Renew my mind so I can do your perfect will. And then what happens? We start dreaming God's dreams. We start thinking like God thinks. We start loving the things that God loves. And before we know it, we're walking in our purpose. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, last one. As we, as we walk in our purpose, who gets the glory? Okay, so we are transformed for glory. 1 Peter 5.10, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory. Oh, did I read the right one? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mary. Matthew 5.16, let your light, sorry, go back. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. There you are. So as we let our light shine, we actually, this, that we, they're going to say, who, who is this person that is so full of peace and joy, the fruit that God gives, right? That's an outflow of the fruit that is within us, right? And we begin to shine for God's glory. I want to say one more thing about this pot. Boy, we're sure, good thing I didn't throw it away back in that day in 1998. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Jurisic was the teacher, and um, when Mr. Jurisic had to use his powers of deduction to know who made this pot, how do we know that? There's a clue on the back. Oh, I don't want to put my finger in there. There's a little spider house in there. If a spider crawls out, I'm literally launching this into the balcony. Um, Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay. I try to be so perfect up here. Okay. Okay. Who gets this A plus? That's what it says in pencil, like a good teacher. He wrote that. Who gets this A plus? So Mr. Jurisic looked at this pot and thought, huh, the colors are well balanced. It's very symmetrical. There's no, like, it's not unbalanced in any way. And then he went to see who made it, and there was no name on it. And he was very curious, and he said, who gets this A+. You see, when we shine for God, people are going to look at us, and they're going to say, what is different about that person? And when I say that, some of you go, oh, I don't do a very good job of this. I don't do a very good job of this at all. And this is the part I want to talk about with transformation. There's transformation part two here, and that is called sanctification. <laughs> okay? There is a work that is already done in you from when you accepted Christ. And then, we move, and God sees you as holy, perfect, all those things. His righteousness at work in you, it's done. But then... There's the next step, and that is walking out. And sanctification has um, definitions, okay? And that's talking about the action and the process of purity. My definition is that God is patient with me as I continue to walk towards Christ-likeness. That is really what it is. So we don't have to be perfect. Your transformation is not dependent on your perfection, okay? Okay? But, but as we move towards, boy, we, let's hope that we are moving towards Christ's likeness. That is the journey of the Christian walk, okay? And so as we shine that light for God, he gets the glory for this because relationship, all the things that I talked about that God has given to us, a relationship you don't just inhale. I mean, if you try to do that, just, right, we're going to pass out, right? That's not healthy. Inhale exhale. Relationship is give, and relationship is, is give and take, right? And, and so God, he gets the glory as he bestows the blessings on him, but on us. But you know what? We never want to stop there. We always want to keep giving him the glory again and again and again. And so that word glory is doxa, and there's another form of doxa, because I told you God wants to share It's sharing in his glory, which is the other verse that I started to read. 1 Peter 5.10. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. He transformed you for relationship, 
for purpose and for glory. And, and today as we worshiped, I sensed the glory of God here. Did you? It was so, so rich. And it reminded me, how am I doing? I'm almost done. One little story. When I first began, at, um, I worked at a residential home for women in addiction. And my first day, um, worship team, if you would come, please. My first day, I was very nervous. I've told this story to the women, and forgive me, a few of you, you have heard this before. But it's, it, it was life-changing for me. Um, and I walked into the room where there was, at the time, about five of them. And I was nervous. I was dressed up. <laughs> Didn't know how this was all going to go. And my boss and friend, Fiona, said, why don't we go around and everybody... Uh, just introduce yourself to Linda. <laughs> and as the women went around the, the room and they began to tell me about their lives, these are generally the things that were said in that moment. My life was so dark. My life, everything was darkness. I knew that I was going to die in my addiction. I didn't have any love in my life, and I think I never had love ever from the very time I was born. Another one said, I was on a bridge ready to say goodbye to everything because I had no hope for my life. And I, would, I knew I was never going to be able to get out of it. But God sent this person who was walking by and they told me about a place I could go where I could be loved and I, and I met Jesus and another one said alcohol was my life and I lived for that purpose and that alone that was it and when I met Jesus I learned that his love was greater than any power any addiction any strong thing that was attacking my life and making me, sending me straight to hell. And I can have hell on earth. And that was what life was like. But then the world, my whole world opened when I met Jesus. And his grace came on me. I didn't know what that was, but grace entered my life. And I realized that I could be loved. And I realized that there was hope for my life. And now I see things totally different because I'm loved and I'm surrounded by people. This is, this is what's happening. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I was all dressed and I'm ball, I can't, you know, bawling. And the words that, that they said touched my heart in such a deep way. Grace, mercy, love. Things I've heard since I was four years old, everybody. And the reason I'm telling you this, these women, they were transformed. And I knew that I had been transformed. But when I went to church the Sunday after that, my first week there, I stood in the seat and we started singing songs. The same songs we had been singing since I, you know, since I was four. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Look. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he changed me, how he filled me, how he, how, to the uttermost, I all of a sudden, I literally went like this. I, I just, it was like it all came alive to me again because God transforms us. He changes us and we are not the same. There was an old and there was a new. And if you've known Christ all your life, sometimes we lose sight of this. But it is just as applicable for your life as it is for the one that got saved later and had the dramatic transformation. It's for all of us. He transforms us. He's transforming us into relationship. And if you don't have that today, Number one, that is something you want to, if you want to get that straight with God, you can do that today. Don't wait. Already too much time has gone by. <laughs> and so we're going to pray together. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And you can pray it along with me if you like. 
And after, there's going to be a number on the screen. And if you would like to text that number and then put salvation in there, it just lets us know that you prayed that prayer and we can come alongside you and support you. Okay, so we're going to do that. Number two, if you're here and you haven't been walking in your purpose, you just know it. You just know. And for maybe some of the reasons I mentioned or maybe some totally other reason, I want you to know that God has compassion on you today. He doesn't see you with condemnation. He sees you with love and he's drawing you back. And today, if I just reminded you about your transformation, if I just reminded you in the smallest way, then good, because we need it. We need to remind our souls about what the the grace and mercy of God actually has done for us all. And so uh, let's stand together. And we're gonna pray, let's pray together. If you want to pray this prayer, you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died I believe that you rose again. Thank you for loving me so much. I accept you today in my heart and life. And be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord, also, Lord, we just want to lift up today. I just want to pray this moment for any person that is in this room. God, maybe they have been walking with you a very long time, but the newness and freshness of your spirit's power, God, maybe there's been a dulling. And so I pray today that by the power of the spirit of God that you would remind them, Lord, make it so real to them that moment that they said yes to you. That Father, that you would ignite us again, Lord, and set us on fire for your purpose, for your plans for our lives. Thank you, God, that we have an opportunity to reflect Christ in those that we see around us, oh God. But Father, that we can give you glory. We give you praise. Father, that is our highest calling today. So Lord, we do, we worship you and we thank you for how good you are. And Lord Jesus, as we go from this place that we would not forget, but that Lord, that we would be so mindful and that our, that our walk with you, Lord, would just take on a whole new dimension And Father, I pray that for my brothers and sisters and for myself on this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.